The topic of today's webinar is COVID-19 recovery, relapse and resilience, how healthcare leaders can build and sustain a resilient new reality. Uh, and it's, you know, it's great to see a lot of uh, uh, people joining us from across, across the region. Um, we have people from Bahamas, Bermuda, uh, Cayman, Barbados, British Virgin Islands, St. Vincent, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, the UK, the US. Uh, so obviously um, there's a lot of interest in the topic. So thank you again. Uh, and there's no doubt that COVID-19 the COVID pandemic has had probably the largest global impact on health, healthcare systems and the people across the world that we've ever experienced in any of our lifetimes. The global pandemic has exposed significant weaknesses and strengths across these health systems. Some countries have fared better than others, um, but be it, be it due to policy or health system capacity, the, the preparedness for the pandemic, you know, ro how robust the supply chains were, the level of technological advancement, you know, the resilience of operations or workforce agility. But there's one constant that this pandemic is giving every healthcare system pause for thought and the experience and opportunity uh, to build for a new reality. So our speakers today will be exploring, you know, these opportunities. How can we take where we are and, and uh, make improvements to make our systems more resilient? So I'll quickly introduce the three, uh, three speakers today. Uh, all KPMG. Um, the first is Becky Fenton, uh, who is the acting head of healthcare for KPMG in the UK. And she has 20 years experience working for and with healthcare organizations, including commissioners, providers, regulators, integrated care systems and governments. Prior to joining KPMG, Becky worked for the UK National Health Service for 14 years and was an executive board director for her last 10 years in the NHS where she held numerous positions, including Deputy CEO, CFO, Turnaround Director, and Director of Strategy and Transformation. Uh, the second speaker here is Dr. Ed Fitzgerald. Uh, Ed is the clinical lead for care system redesign for KPMG. Uh, as well as in the UK, he's also a member of our global healthcare practice. He qualified in medicine from Magdalen College, University of Oxford, and has 20 years experience of clinical practice and management in the NHS and international health system. Uh, with his global role, he has worked across 29 countries and he's also actively authored over 100 academic publications. He previously played a central role in pioneering global crowdsourced collaborative health research networks. And if you meet him, I, I guess he can explain to you uh, what that is. And then finally, Sripal um, Doshi is a senior manager within KPMG's management healthcare consulting practice in Canada, and he has 12 years experience advising on healthcare transformation. Um, Sripal has worked quite a few years alongside myself to provide KPMG support to the government of the Bahamas in helping to design and launch the country's national health insurance scheme in 2017 and uh, continues to advise on future expansions of this program. Over the past three months, Sripal has also led the Ontario Ministry of Health PPE Task Force during COVID-19 and has overseen the purchasing of PPE and allocation and distribution of nearly 40 million units to 2,700 sector entities across the Ontario province. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand over to um, Becky Benton, who's going to kick off, uh, and then uh, she will hand over to the others. Please feel free to ask any uh, questions through the chat, uh, and we'll we'll answer them if we can as we go. Um, we're going to try and keep it strictly to kind of one hour, because um, I know you all have uh, schedules to adhere to. Um, so with that, I will hand over to Becky. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> Bit of an echo there from my end, but hopefully that will sort itself out. If we can move on to the next slide, please. So I just want to kick off and share that uh, KPMG healthcare practice globally has been um, privileged to support over 95 projects now across the globe as healthcare systems um, and countries have responded to the coronavirus 
We've been involved in a huge array of different types of projects, including our very own Dr. Ed Fitzgerald, who you'll hear from shortly, who's been based out in Bermuda since lockdown, has been supporting them with their plans for response and implementation um, of those plans to deal with the um, coronavirus pandemic. Next slide, please, Ed. So we summarised here the, the 10 ways that we've seen in particular um, that health and care systems have reacted uh, to the coronavirus pandemic um, and how they're starting to become more resilient on the back of it. Um, Ed's going to talk in a little bit more detail um, shortly about five areas in particular that we're seeing as emerging priorities in the new norm. But I just want to pick out a few of the areas here that we've seen in the initial response phases. Um, with regards to number nine, so one of the things that we've seen resoundingly across the world is that health systems have had to come together in a much more collaborative and integrated way to to work across regions, across jurisdictions, to, um, to use their economies of scale across bigger geographical footprints, and also to collaborate further in order to respond to the initial COVID um, peaks. Um, and that is a resounding message that we're hearing now around the transformation agenda as countries look to, to become resilient and to transform on the back of this. With respect to digital, um, I mean, as we all know, healthcare has been very late to the party when it comes to digital transformation compared to other sectors like banking and like retail. One of the things that, that the coronavirus pandemic um, actually enforced was particularly digitization of the front door. So access to primary care, to outpatient consultations, these sorts of things through either digital means through smartphones or, or purely just using the old fashioned telephone, but to keep people in their own homes as part of the consultations and diagnosis. There's a huge opportunity now to really start to accelerate the digital transformation program as countries now respond and become more resilient and into the transformation phase. The third area I'd like to pick out is workforce. So we've seen a number of innovative workforce solutions, again, with health systems working across uh, in an integrated way across geographies. In particular in the UK, we realised when we um, needed to build additional ITU capacity and additional acute care capacity that we couldn't staff these in the traditional models. There just weren't enough doctors and nurses. And so we had to think very innovatively about splitting out non-clinical roles and giving these to, to non-clinical staff to allow our clinical staff to, to really work at the top of their game and to maximise the capacity that we had. Fourthly, supply chain. So we know that supply chain has been a huge issue across the world. Um, every country has been having to cope um, with a sudden increase in demand around areas like PPE. Um, and this has been a huge issue for, for all areas. And again, even more important now in terms of resilience in predicting future demand and understanding how agile supply chains can respond to that, uh, again, within geographies and across countries. And then fifthly and finally on this slide, um, project management. So again, we saw in particular in the UK the need to respond to coronavirus pandemic by injecting significant additional amounts of capacity and capability to, to frankly get things done at pace um, and delivered on the ground. We've certainly always seen in the UK um, some great strategies, some great plans, some great policies, but the execution of these on the ground has always been the thing that's been really difficult to actually achieve. We've demonstrated in the UK across a number of areas that good project management and acceleration of this different um, and extra capacity can really make a difference to get things done in incredible timeframes. Thank you. And I'll now pass over to uh, back to you, Ed. Well, thank you very much, Becky. And it's uh, an absolute pleasure to be able to join everyone today and share some of our global learning experience. And what I'm going to be running through in the next 10, 15 minutes is around the new reality that we've been seeing from conversations with healthcare organizations and systems right around the world. So I think a good place for us to start is just think about our view of the evolution of the pandemic to date. And while none of us have a crystal ball to be able to see where things are going to end up, we've got a reasonable picture from previous pandemics and the development to date of how we think this is likely to progress and proceed. And this 
uh, slide sets out our key ideas around the phasing that's going to be developing over the over the time ahead. And I think there's a few key points to, to, to pull out of this um, that are important for healthcare and health systems. First of all, most countries, most jurisdictions are very broadly on a similar trajectory. And it may be that their position on that trajectory right now is different, uh, the timing, the size of the peaks and troughs, but we're starting to see similar patterns emerge. And I think the second point is, importantly, and we're already starting to see this now, is that COVID is certainly not going to be a single event. Um, it isn't going to go away immediately. Things aren't going to suddenly return to normal. And that's really important for thinking about uh, the planning and the way that health systems are able to react and respond over the months ahead. Now, we, we don't know the timing of that. We, we can't predict when that's likely to be. But fundamentally, this uh, crisis isn't going to be over until uh, a vaccine to coronavirus is, is available. Not, and that's important to recognise, not just one when, when it's uh, successfully tested, created. Um, there also needs to be a global vaccination uh, programme in place to actually ensure that people receive that vaccination. And it's likely that that is at least a 12 to 18 month window um, going forward. And we're likely to see a number of uh, successive waves and, and recurrences and lockdowns in different jurisdictions developing until that point. So the next point is that this is, I mean, this is a really profound disruption and it's going to be ongoing. So healthcare providers and systems really need to think about their response over quite a period of time now going forward, how they're going to recover uh, from this, how they will deal with relapses, and what the new reality is going to look like at the end of that. Now, all, all of that, unfortunately, does sound uh, worrying and uh, troubling. But I think as we go through this, I hope to show you that there are opportunities within this for healthcare systems as well. It's not, it's not going to be all bad. So the first place to start um, is sharing with you our recovery framework. So we've been doing a lot of thinking at KPMG uh, with our, our colleagues and clients around the world to help try and provide some structure to the thinking around that recovery and what a future new reality is going to look like. And you can see that here on this slide. And we try to relate that to the prevailing health conditions and the wider economic conditions that will obviously impact um, in an interrelated way with this. Most healthcare systems are already in phase one of the healthcare recovery phase, they're managing the outbreak. And in the next 10, 15 minutes, we're gonna concentrate on talking about existing confinement. And then most importantly, the five new elements that we see as being most important to concentrate on and finding what that resilient new reality looks like for healthcare. And we have a more detailed version of this um, behind this that we can share with you as well. So before moving into those five key buckets, just to think about um, exit strategies first and foremost. Many jurisdictions are already starting to work through this. Testing and surveillance has been a very prominent point, but that alone isn't sufficient. And I think it's worth just emphasizing the four pillars that we see as being fundamental for developing successful exit strategies to move into the recovery and new reality phase. Testing and surveillance is useful, but has to be part of a much more robust and scaled contact tracing system. Now, many jurisdictions are starting to bring in digital elements of that, but being able to very rapidly identify contacts who've interacted with both in terms of proximity and duration um, with positively tested individuals are really important to be able to follow some fairly solid public health measures, track and trace individuals, uh, and ensure that they are quarantined in order to keep our naught um, below one and ensure that this is uh, not exponentially growing and progressing. In tandem with that, much more carefully stratified population-based approaches are going to be important. The risk is not the same for everyone and increasingly research is starting to show that. We need to make sure that the testing and surveillance and the contact tracing is particularly targeted on groups that are going to be most at risk. And we know already that that relates to age, gender, um, pre-existing health conditions, for example. In addition, also uh, geographical localization, we're starting to see hotspots emerging in different places around the world. So bringing all of that together to deliver a population health approach on top of the testing and surveillance and robust and scale contact tracing is going to be really important. And then finally, the partnership and collaboration. And this links to my previous comment around um, jurisdictions being on similar trajectories. We can all do a much better job of um, learning from others and sharing experience, not just locally, but regionally, nationally, and internationally too, 
Um, and I hope part of us, us sharing that experience today will be useful for you in what we've already learned from places that are delivering best practice already around the world. So what I'd want to go on to in a little bit more detail now is um, five key priorities and the number of actions arising from these that we've seen um, from those who are successfully managing, reacting, responding, and moving towards recovery in different healthcare providers and systems around the world. And those five buckets where we really think that um, action and resource needs to be focused are firstly, digital delivery. Secondly, uh, a more agile workforce. Thirdly, harnessing both of those to develop new care models to be able to actually deliver care at the front line in the future. And then underpinning those three, much more resilient operations for healthcare providers and systems. And all of that is dependent on a greater financial resilience as well. So I'll go into those in a little bit more detail now and share some of uh, our observations, perspectives, learnings, and, and best practice with you. So starting with digital delivery, I think many would agree that healthcare has been widely acknowledged as being pretty slow um, to undergo the digital transformation that we've seen in many other industries around the world. And it's, it's often commented to me um, that it's very easy for you to open an app on your phone and look at your bank balance, um, but very few people are able to do the same and book an appointment or see test results. Um, and that's just at the, the front end of um, patient-facing delivery. There's a lot more digital opportunities underpinning that. Now, perhaps one of the most profound, rapid, and um, obvious changes in response to the advent of coronavirus in the last few months has been an incredibly rapid digital transformation in healthcare. And I've, I've heard it said to me that we've seen almost 10 years digital transformation in four months so far this year. So it's been absolutely incredible. Um, the most obvious element of that has been um, the shift to digital front door. So social distancing, um, the need to try and manage patients out of um, uh, healthcare settings, at least initially, and triage them, has been overtaken by remote consultations, be that by phone or video. And we've, we've seen a huge shift in, in the UK and the National Health Service, typically over the last few years, at most 10 to perhaps 20% of consultations have been delivered remotely, either online or by telephone. And that's now completely flipped in the space of a few months, with uh, over 80% of first consultations now being delivered in, um, online or remotely initially. I think most people would say that um, this is progress, been trying to push it for quite a long time, and we really need to now lock that in. But some of the problems that have risen around this have been the fact that many healthcare systems have rapidly reached for off-the-shelf solutions that aren't embedded into typical healthcare provision workflows and certainly are, aren't part of the existing business plan um, and business model for those organizations. So we're going to need to see quite a profound transition to ensure that this change is embedded, uh, that it's secure, that it's safe, that it's part of an appropriate clinical workflow, and it's recognized as part of the business model going forward. And we've already seen um, some good examples um, globally, Baptist Health, one we've flagged here, uh, being able to repurpose staff to um, manage and run telephone hotline services, rapidly developing chatbots to be able to manage online queries, introducing nurse triage over the telephone and remote triage, video triage for the first line assessment of patients. Um, it's how that is now embedded going forward and, and captured to maintain those virtual working models. That's going to be the real challenge. So we're already seeing uh, a big need from clients to be able to think about how we um, embed those blended care pathways going forward, what the investment is going to be required to be able to um, get, uh, take those off the shelf, rapidly adopted um, solutions to be able to make them something that is just a standard way that care is delivered going forward. So digital is the first important bucket. The uh, second just, is... Uh, just before you move on, uh, I, got, I got a question that came in on mm, digital. Um, and one of the, what it's saying, I think, is, is you know, there's already uh, inequalities in access to healthcare um, and you know, will will moving towards a more digital model be likely to increase those disparities in some cases rather than decrease the uh, inequalities in access? So I think that's a really important point, actually. And it's one of the risks with the rapid off-the-shelf adoption 
without embedding it into appropriate clinical workflows that we're, we're seeing might be perpetuated. Um, now, it's not always necessarily, I think, as people would um, ordinarily think. Um, uh, many people who um, are groups that traditionally haven't engaged with um, digital consultation so far have actually been encouraged to adopt this because of the need for them to shield. And I'm thinking particularly of the older age group as part of this. Um, and if you look at um, if you look at many purpose-built and tailored digital solutions for um, frontline uh, consultations, they take this into account with um, easier um, uh, easier uh, ways of interacting through larger fonts, easier icons, well designed, well you know, so that people who are perhaps less familiar with um, this way of um, operating can can do that. Whereas the typical off-the-shelf solutions that have been adopted so far perhaps are less part of that. Um, I think we're, it's going to have to do a lot of work to actually look at how specific populations that are at risk of being excluded from digital transformation are brought into this. But most importantly, for those who aren't able to engage, that the um, points of contact, the single points of contact for access to health system take that into account and provide all necessary alternatives. And it may be that with a shift towards digital and some elements of automation and triage that actually more resource might be able to be put in for those patients who are at risk of being excluded by digital transformation. So it's a, it's a really important point um, and one that certainly thinking is evolving on at the moment. Um, and very happy to take any further questions or uh, now or at the end as we, as we go through. Um, so the second point is around agile workforce. Now, I think it's it's safe to say that healthcare globally was not in a strong position um, going into this pandemic from a workforce perspective. It's been well documented that internationally we are profoundly short of healthcare workers. Um, the WHO has estimated that by 2030 we'll need an extra um, additional 18 million healthcare workers to be able to deliver the anticipated um, need at that point. So starting a, a global pandemic from that position wasn't a, a good place to start with. And I think it's important to recognize the immense toll that the pandemic has placed on staff. You can see here from a, a study in March and JAMA um, about the personal issues that staff have faced in, in terms of delivering this. And staff have been asked to work very differently, um, but actually um, there are good elements that have come out of this and the change in recognition of staff's job titles in relation to the tasks and competences and recognizing how that can feed into different ways of delivering and repurposing staff has been one element that's really been highlighted. A much greater flexibility in roles and scopes of practice in order to deliver and a shift to more flexible working and for back office staff remote working that previously healthcare has certainly been quite behind on its thinking around that area. A great example of this is from NHS Nightingale in London. Um, for those who aren't familiar with it, part of the very early response of the NHS was to stand up a number of repurposed facilities. Um, in London, um, a very large conference centre was taken over and in the space of just over a week, repurposed into a 4,000 bedded healthcare facility. Quite a remarkable feat. Um, but one of the elements of that, one of the great challenges was how do you staff this against a, a workforce which is already short of the the people that are required and part of that was to actually break down barriers and look at the tasks and competences and develop a unique clinical model that completely changed workforce um, ratios from a typical ICU staffing um, nursing ratio of one to one to one to six which wasn't through just stretching nurses and spreading them much more thinly it was asking how do you look at the typical tasks and roles they undertake and bring others in to help support and backfill in order to enable them to be able to work to a one to six ratio. And in doing so, pull out that a lot of the typical um, roles and tasks that you might expect an ICU nurse to undertake can very well be undertaken by others who are already competent or with a very short amount of training can help make the best use of that ICU nurse experience across the broadest range of patients possible. And so there's elements of this that we can, we can pull out and hopefully take forward. Another one, is, and we've seen this in many jurisdictions, is the much more organized use of um, volunteers and third sector 
how can they support the existing healthcare workforce? And again, that's something that would be fantastic if we can embed far beyond the coronavirus pandemic to really be able to develop some lasting change in, in the staffing models. Um, I think it's safe to say that for most jurisdictions and organisations, they're really going to have to go back and look at their previous workforce plan and revisit that in, in the future new reality. Um, but again, some good that will come out of that, I think, is a much greater attention to preventing staff burnout, recognising how hard many frontline healthcare staff are working, and seeing what we can do to help better support them um, in delivering their care going forward. I'll move on to the next bucket around new care models. So really contingent on the workforce and a new digital way of providing care, we need to bring those together into completely new care models. And we're already starting to see really innovative and new approaches that, that bring those together and deliver this. And I think there are some important lessons from history that we can learn around this. Um, typically, and certainly if you look at um, my home back in London, originally there would have been dedicated fever hospitals before the days of antibiotics for dealing with patients with contagious diseases. And while we certainly aren't going to necessarily replicate those these days, we're all, we've already seen evidence of the profound impact of um, hospitals in the potential for them to become incubators to exacerbate the disease, thinking particularly of Lombardy in Italy, and the need to separate out COVID positive from non-COVID patients to ensure that hospitals don't become big centres for further transmission. Now, how we separate hot and cold sites COVID positive and COVID negative patients is already taking a lot of thinking. Um, but in addition to that, there are aspects of the backlog that's developed in these four or five months. Um, it's been estimated that over 28 million surgeries have been cancelled or postponed so much um, uh, globally. And it's going to take so much more resource to be able to catch up on that. What's, what's the care model going to be for that? And how are those patients kept away from um, COVID positive uh, treatment centres. Now, we're already helping develop new care pathways and programmes, both for that recovery of uh, catching up on screening and surveillance and cancelled and deferred treatments, but also what the pathways look like for COVID positive models going forward and how hospitals or areas of hospitals can be sectioned out to help deliver that. Um, a great example um, from thinking about an innovative new care model is um, Santis, who've been doing fantastic work to uh, collaborate between specialists and community partners to try and ensure that care is delivered in the right setting and including through digital enablement of that. So for patients who are COVID positive, how can they be best managed in the community, appropriately managed in the community, but to try and keep them out of um, traditional centralised acute hospital model settings unless they really need to be there in order to protect uh, staff and protect patients, but also maintain acute capacity for the surge of patients that, that comes as a, uh, as a peak is rising. So there's a lot to think about here that ties together the, the staffing and the digital models. Um, and there's a few yes. questions Please. come in. Um, and there's one actually in the chat here, uh, it was one of uh, three questions I received um, and, and in terms of access. And the question here, I guess, is uh, from a private sector uh, healthcare perspective, you know, what is the impact of um, people losing their jobs as a result of COVID uh, and the loss of their insurance, access to their insurance policies? And what are health systems doing to, to help increase access for those types of people? So it's a big question um, that, that many jurisdictions are grappling with right now to try and be able to, to answer this. I think there's, there's, there's two elements, um, one around um, private sector um, and their activity going forward. And so in many jurisdictions, we're already seeing, and particularly in the UK, the almost the entirety of the private sector has been contracted to try and support the, um, the public sector hospital system, um, primarily through maintaining an element of business as normal and healthcare through um, normal diagnostics, non-COVID diagnostics, treatments and, and surgery. So there is certainly a role for private sector delivery in this through some fairly innovative thinking and, and um, commercial business planning around that. 
Um, secondly, the impact on sustainability of the private sector. So I think many are looking at um, healthcare delivery at the moment as having been deferred for the private sector. Um, certainly, there has been a great dropping off in the activity in, in that area. Um, I think there's a question mark about to what extent that's going to be deferred versus lost. Will there be a rebound uh, for private sector delivery um, as coronavirus um, fades? Um, I think it's, that's, that's difficult to make that assumption. Um, I think a, a large amount of activity will be lost. And certainly, if you look at surgery, it's very likely the thresholds will change completely for surgery going forward, and a lot will continue to be deferred and many patients themselves will decide that they do not want to be in a healthcare setting um, while coronavirus is still prevalent um, for, a, for an elective procedure. Um, so it's likely that that will impact significantly on the, the viability um, and commercial models of the private sector going forward. I think the third point around um, what and what will be the impact on this um, for patients that uh, have lost their jobs and need to be able to um, still access healthcare I think many jurisdictions are looking to expand public sector provision to be able to meet this. Um, how that's done is really ongoing emerging thinking at the moment. Um, there needs to be much greater collaboration and partnership in order to be able to deliver that. Um, and of course, all of this is happening at a time when the, the public purse, the economic situation is, is not in a good place to be able to rapidly expand to do this. But however, um, there, there are ways that this can be done. And I would certainly argue, and probably Triple is going to uh, talk shortly, that actually um, now is the time to be delivering that and rolling out a much greater approach because actually it's uh, it's fundamental to the future economic recovery of countries to be able to meet that um, uh, demand within within the public sector going forward. Okay, there was one, one other question um, with, with respect to innovation and digital solutions. Um, and are we seeing a, a difference between single payer systems and their uh, innovation versus fee-based systems um, you know, as this pandemic unfolds? It's, it's interesting. It's something we've been looking at quite closely. And it's, it's difficult to say that the, you can delineate bet, between the two based on the payment model of the health system. Um, and many jurisdictions have been very quick to uh, push the uptake of uh, digital transformation um, because realistically that's been the only way that they've been able to prop up um, the healthcare systems in the, as part of that initial response and reaction phase. And that's the same whether you see rapid changes in a predominantly private delivery healthcare system in the US, or if you look at um, a predominantly public sector delivery in, um, in Germany um, and uh, largely state delivered healthcare systems in Singapore, they have all been very quick um, to uh, promote digital delivery of healthcare. Um, I think that the difference has been more um, dependent on the speed and agility of the healthcare system itself to be able to deliver that. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting point, and, and we're probably not through this enough yet to be able to draw firm conclusions around that. And I'll, I'll push on to the next um, phase, and we have a bit more time for questions at the end, and we'll be able to bring some colleagues in at that point. But um, the next bucket is around operational resilience. Everything that we've talked about so far is contingent on being able to maintain a smooth flow and resilient operations of the healthcare system to be able to deliver any of this. Um, we've certainly seen, and, and you will have seen on the news globally, uh, perhaps this has been one of the most profound challenges um, to be able to support healthcare systems and prevent the collapse that's been seen in, in some countries and the massive um, overwhelming of um, healthcare uh, uh, hospitals as part of this. There are a few elements that I'll pick out um, that, that really underpin this. Perhaps the most obvious that most have seen and, and heard on the news is around the ability to maintain supplies and very, very rapidly uh, scale the appropriate delivery, particularly of PPE, um, which my colleague Triple has been involved in in Canada and will be able to talk a little bit more about as well. Um, but really underpinning that, has been a largely unmet need to be able to forecast supplies in order to be able to get them to the right place at the right time. And in healthcare at the moment, that forecasting ability um, to use data analytics and to be able to use a real-time um, feedback based on demand um, hasn't really existed. 
it's something that's much more um, prevalent in the commercial system. And you'll be familiar with many online retailers who are absolutely already using that to be able to maintain a um, supply and demand and meet it appropriately. And I think going forward, the new reality will have a much bigger role for predictive analytics in healthcare to be able to monitor currently what's going on and be able to use that to forward plan and then appropriately use that modeling through dashboards to make evidence-based decisions on what needs to be in place, when and where, a much greater ability to use the resource that we already have and make sure that's in the right place at the time that it's needed. And I think many healthcare systems, by their fragmented nature, have not been able to fully harness that. And a, a more centralized cooperative approach will be really important in further waves of this response and the future recovery. The final point, of course, all of this has to be paid for. Um, and we are already seeing many healthcare organizations and indeed governments um, really stretched by the rising costs and increased cash burn. And in the public sector where there have been um, monies made available by, by government to be able to um, commit to supplies and ongoing um, delivery of healthcare, that's perhaps been less of an immediate concern. But many private healthcare organisations are, as we already mentioned, challenged by the increased cash burn, the loss of income, um, and a huge impact on profitability going forward. So, um, and of course, this is something that's more prevalent outside healthcare. We're seeing many organisations already going bankrupt. Um, but the financial settlement going forward is going to be really important for recovery. Um, the reporting and, and, and um, accounting to be able to make sure that the new reality is appropriately budgeted for, it's part of a fundable business plan, and that there's a viable business model underpinning this is going to be fantastically important over and above the immediate liquidity concerns um, in the next few months. And there are a number of examples of organizations that we've been working with to help manage that immediate cash flow and reporting, um, and then actually think about what that means going forward for the organization um, to remain viable. In the uh, future. So out of those five buckets come 10 points, and I'm not going to go into each of these individually at the moment, but from, from our work supporting providers around the world and organizations and speaking with many, many different healthcare organizations in different jurisdictions, what we've done here is prioritize what we think are the 10 key actions that providers and systems need to think about in those five areas um, that are really the greatest priorities to be able to move towards what the resilient new reality needs to look like for healthcare organizations going forward. So we're happy to delve into those further, but I'll, I'll pause there and I'm gonna hand back over to Becky to talk about what successful delivery of all of this now means. Thank you, Ed. We move on to the next slide. Brilliant, thank you. So as we start to think about um, Ireland's healthcare systems, this is a slide that sets out some of the, the common issues and opportunities seen across Ireland healthcare systems, which from, from my experience um, a few years ago with the states of Guernsey and most recently with Bermuda, um, absolutely do Ireland jurisdictions have um, very specific issues that are unique because of their island um, jurisdictions to their healthcare systems and therefore need to be considered in terms of the recovery and the transformation phases post-COVID. Um, to pull out um, a, a few of them just briefly, as Ed was just talking about in terms of financial resilience, so on number seven, payment models, we've been seeing the cost of care increasing um, across the world in healthcare systems prior to COVID. Um, but actually, as we, you know, as we now know, that has been significantly impacted by the cost of dealing with the pandemic. Um, and so an initial starting point really needs to be to understand the affordable budget for spend on health and care within Ireland jurisdictions, understanding the balance between public and private sources, so tax sources, insurance premiums and co-pays. Um, but understanding, you know, from the economic situation now, what is an affordable amount to spend and how does that compare with other countries across the world who have, um, in some instances, been able to reduce costs and improve outcomes? And then how can that, that funding source be paid to providers in a way that aligns incentives 
and really drives that value. So improves outcomes um, and isn't just a kind of volume-based payment, which um, in itself could start to increase the overall cost. And then very much linked to that on the other side of the coin in terms of the sources is actually truly understanding on point nine, the true cost of providing care. And often we see this gap between affordability and cost being the gap um, between um, the funding sources and the payments to providers, where actually it's masking what the true cost of care is. So how much are we spending on salaries, which is obviously linked to headcount and workforce and skill mix? How much are we spending on consumables, on the maintenance of our buildings, those sorts of things? So one of the things that I advocate is, is really parking actually that payment flow from whatever system you're in, from the, the um, commissioners or from the government, from the insurance companies, but actually getting down into the, the actual costs of providing care and understanding what the drivers of those actual costs are and how trends are driving costs up in some places and where inefficiencies are also driving up costs, so it can therefore be, be improved ultimately. Um, then um, the next area that we've seen as a, as a really key item coming out of Ireland healthcare is governance and regulation. So often this um, has been missing in many instances um, and can adversely affect the quality of care being provided, um, can increase variation, and can mean they're not always the best practices being followed. So we are advocating proportionate governance and regulation in island jurisdictions, but something that does ensure that quality and consistency um, is maintained. And then the fourth area just to pull out on this slide is the role of primary care. So primary care moving away from a model where they react to the patients that turn up at their doors, the one that is actually driving um, forward the understanding of the population health needs and driving the improvement in population health and quality of care through the proactive demand management as the kind of gatekeeper of the population into the care system. Next slide, please, Ed. And then in addition to those very specific issues facing um, Ireland, restrictions. These are the things that we're seeing in the in the post-COVID new reality for healthcare. Again, I'll just pick, pick out a few of these. So much greater volatility in demand. So previously, actually, demand was, was pretty easy to predict. Um, but now we're seeing huge volatility, not just driven by the COVID peaks and potentially the second peaks that will come, um, but also through changes in demand in the, the more typical urgent care areas like strokes and heart attacks driven by patient behaviours, people that are in lockdown and aren't accessing care for these conditions. In addition, as well, the, the dealing with the backlog in the planned and elective care, so starting to catch up on diagnostics and surgical procedures for things like cancer, orthopaedics. So much greater volatility and demand now needs to be considered in the transformation phases and, and particularly linked to the new care models. Um, Inside-led decisions has been a key thing that's come out of the learning. So having access to really high-quality data, ideally real-time, that will inform strategy and actions in, in, in a timely basis has been crucial in the responses to um, the COVID pandemic. And where there's been an absence of that, you can actually see the, the um, significant impact that it's had on the responses. Another one is then patient expectations. So these have been increasing within healthcare. We've seen again across the globe people's expectations of what, what they can access through healthcare has been growing. But now, post the pandemic, um, they've experienced new ways to access healthcare, and their demands for this to continue and to evolve and accelerate uh, are much greater and much stronger now. We've already talked a lot about workforce. Um, and we will come on to enterprise-wide innovation on the next slide, please, Ed. So, as I said um, near the start of the presentation, one of the things that we've heard resoundingly across the globe is that collaboration and integration of health and care has been one of the key things that has enabled countries to respond uh, and start to move into their recovery and transformation phases. Um, we've talked a lot 
about integration of care models and, and the, you know, the disadvantages of the lack of integration, which are set out on the left. But fragmented provider systems, which is ultimately what many, many healthcare systems currently have, because that's how they were uh, evolved over time in an ad hoc way. Um, fragmented provider systems, um, which work in silos, poorly co coordinated pathways and care, demand very much unmanaged, people just referred um, around and within the system. Um, very difficult to create new models of care because everybody's working in silos and often a big focus on the hospital at the center. So there's a lot of care being provided in the hospital, which could be provided outside of that closer to home. And as a patient, very, very difficult to navigate the system with multiple handoffs and multiple different access points. So the integration of health and care systems, which in some places really accelerated on the back of their initial response to COVID. We've seen there a much greater um, integration and coordination of services and care, removing duplication and removing variation. A much better way of managing demand through single points of access um, and people collaborating and starting to innovate across new models of care. Um, and starting to think much more proactively about the digital transformation, because frankly, they can see in an integrated and collaborated way much more easily where these digital solutions are really going to benefit, as opposed to when they're in their fragmented siloed systems. Next slide, please, Ed. So these are the three things that we're hearing very loudly from across the world again, when when people have successfully start to integrate their health and care systems, there's three key components which stand out as being part of that success. The first is, is the true activation and involvement of patients and carers within the design of these integrated healthcare systems, bringing them right into the middle of the design and particularly enhancing those patients who are tech literate around some of the digital solutions. Secondly, Majority of healthcare providers in, in some research that we did uh, about nine months ago, across over 400 leaders, all said that integrated healthcare systems needed new and different capabilities, and that their current system had significant gaps alongside many of those capabilities, citing again digital workforce, supply chain, um, seamless care, et cetera. Uh, and, and those gaps were a significant barrier to them implementing integrated care. So, so knowing what those gaps are and building them into your transformation plans is crucial. And thirdly, not to underestimate actually that the devil is in the detail when it comes to integrated healthcare systems. We're talking here, true integration means a new architecture for care, a new operating model, thinking about the front, so how patients access, the middle, so how care is coordinated and, and provided by clinicians, um, and the back office, so the corporate services like finance and HR that support the integrated care system. All of this needs to be fundamentally rethought and redesigned in, if you're to truly achieve the integration. Next slide, please, Ed. And so, I mean, integrated care systems, on the one hand, will deliver a lot of the benefits um, and the improvements that we've been talking about. But as, as one of the questions that we had earlier alluded to, see, without the wrapper of universal healthcare, then um, an integrated care system on its own isn't gonna be able to realize the benefits around population health, quality, and cost. I'm gonna hand over now to Shrifel, who's going to wrap up with a few slides around universal healthcare. Thanks, thank you. <laughs> I think um, imperative for universal health coverage is more than ever. Um, and when we look at the, the situation and the context that we're in, um, I'll just allude to um, the story, uh, our news article that came out yesterday from Canada uh, in terms of our projected deficits. And uh, it's really uh, unprecedented levels of deficits that this country is going to run um, and levels that we haven't seen since World War II. And when we look at the genesis of universal health coverage, it came out of a crisis of uh, emerging from World War II and having the NHS stand up a social security and safety net uh, for accessing coverage for all. And that was really part and parcel of uh, the recovery from uh, the war and uh, 
uh, laying the groundwork for economic recovery. And when we look uh, now at how do we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the recovery of the economy really starts at the recovery of the health system and ensuring we have access to uh, health care, uh, ensuring we have access to essential services and testing without patients having to bear that financial burden themselves. And so the need for universal health coverage is more than ever. And we're starting to see uh, nations both uh, globally and in the islands starting to invest in that. And most recently, uh, the Bahamas, uh, a country that we've been supporting in their journey to universal health coverage, has recently doubled their investment in the National Health Insurance Program uh, in order to drive towards uh, greater access and greater integrated care of the health system. Uh, as a snapshot, uh, the Bahamas is a country of nearly 400,000 people that operates a uh, public and private uh, health care system uh, with the public system underpinned by three public hospitals and 80 plus public clinics and then uh, private health care delivered through a network of private providers that is largely accessed through private insurance and self-pay. Uh, but really, to bring uh, universal health coverage to light really requires the integration of these systems uh, and a common uh, standard benefit that all can access without the barrier of cost. And right now, only 30% of individuals have private health insurance coverage, so the imperative to expand that access is important to the economic recovery. Uh, next slide, Ed. So where we are today in terms of the Bahamas UHC journey is uh, it's a five phase uh, approach uh, where right now it's currently focused on primary health care coverage and currently the next phase of expansion is broadening that expansion of primary health care coverage and integrating it with current private sector coverage in order to create a common primary care benefits package that all can access without a barrier uh, to cost. Uh, right now, the program has over 80,000 individuals enrolled, uh, which is approximately 30% of the uninsured population. And really what the government's been trying to achieve with our support is not only the optimal health for citizens and universal health coverage, but really ensuring that there's an efficient and sustainable healthcare system that's founded on public and private partnership. And the role of the private sector in supporting the expansion of services is going to be ever increasingly important. And as we look at uh, individuals losing access to health insurance to, to access private healthcare services, there's a role for the private sector to further step up and join uh, in partnership with government payers uh, to support expanded delivery uh, towards universal coverage. Uh, and when we look at some of the lessons learned, next slide, Ed. Uh, the lessons learned of the Bahamian experience as countries chart their own path towards uh, universal health coverage. And as we look at the current context, uh, there's a couple key lessons that I want to impart on everyone as they do their planning. Uh, first, um, as this pandemic has taught us, uh, the pathway to universal health coverage is not linear. Uh, there will be many bumps in the road and uh, your policy objectives and the strategies that you take need to be responsive to changes in the environment. Uh, so you need to uh, embed flexibility and adaptability in your policy design. And one of those examples is how do you adapt your funding models to further embrace uh, the uh, digital care delivery uh, or uh, introduction of new tests. Um, so that legislative framework really needs to be flexible to allow for uh, adjustments as necessary to expand uh, that benefit package to ensure responsiveness. Uh, second, as this uh, pandemic has taught us, um, equity is, is so important to uh, ensuring that it's at the heart of your strategy um, and making sure that whatever program you design is, is designed to capture as many people as possible and focuses on those who most need access to the health system. And finally, uh, UHC is a shared responsibility. Uh, not only is it a shared responsibility between the public and the private sector, but it requires a coordinated approach to stakeholder engagement uh, and co-designing this path forward in order to gain broader acceptance and broader participation in the program from all individuals involved. But I think, um, you know, the path to UHC, the, the burning platform is now more than ever. Uh, as we chart towards economic recovery, uh, having access to health care is going to be so crucial um, to, to, to being a sustain, sustainable and successful economy moving forward. Thanks, Ed. Great. Thank you, Ava. Back to you, Simon. Okay. Great. Well, well thank you, Shripal. Um, all right, so I think we have about five minutes left, and I haven't yet got any 
further questions. If there's anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I mean, I think maybe one of the, the key themes um, across, uh, you know, the, the operational side and is the people behind, behind healthcare. And um, obviously, the, the healthcare workforce are now sort of being celebrated across the world, for, especially at the front line. But Ed, what have you kind of seen as being the, the sort of the, the ongoing impact on the healthcare workforce? You know, I know in, in this region, for instance, there was a question uh, that came in about nurses uh, and the education of nurses. And going, they, you know, there's a huge, there's been a huge demand leading up to the pandemic uh, and uh, a general shortage. But what is the, what is your view of the sort of future of the healthcare workforce? Simon, it's a it's an interesting question, and I think um, one of the unanticipated um, outcomes of this pandemic uh, and all of the media focus on caring careers and healthcare workers um, may actually turn out to be one of the best recruitment campaigns in recent years to draw attention to the work. Um, and I think in an era of rising unemployment, uh, the p potential to harness that and encourage more people to enter caring careers is a is a really strong opportunity and um, so i wouldn't be at all surprised if in short to medium term we actually saw a bit of a rebound in terms of recruiting people um, but healthcare systems and providers need to be ready for that and need to be positioned to be able to uh, take people in and perhaps rethink about current training models um, and how people are um, uh, brought up to the right competences to be able to deliver work uh, and perhaps revisit some of the more traditional elements of that we've had over the years. So I, I think we will see quite uh, some profound impacts on the healthcare workforce going forward. Okay. Um, and I see we've just got one question here talking about um, do we equate single payer funding with universal healthcare? And Tripal, I'll pass it over to you. I believe there's sort of a number of models really. Absolutely. Um, so I think uh, the single payer healthcare model is obviously one model that you can go down for uh, um, for universal health coverage. But I think largely with established private insurance players um, in the uh, Caribbean islands, uh, it may be a path of looking at uh, mandatory uh, health insurance coverage with the common standard health benefit and regulations on uh, pricing of those premiums uh, that probably allow for greatest participation uh, and minimizing the overall burden on um, the government uh, financing. Um, so I don't think that a single payer uh, financing structure is the only approach to uh, achieving universal health coverage. Um, but uh, fundamentally, uh, you have to look at your own environment and what works best. Uh, certainly in the Bahamas, it's been a multi-payer approach that's been the guiding principle towards universal health coverage. But when we look at um, you know, Canada or other places, uh, it is a single payer model. So you really have to reflect on the current uh, uh, environment and design the model that best fits with your uh, context. Right. I think the uh, the fiscal constraints of, of, of economies are also a major factor in driving that. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Well, I'm afraid um, that everyone we're at 10:59, so we've only uh, we're, we're basically uh, going to have to wrap up here. Um, but I'd like to thank uh, all of the panelists, Ed, Becky, and Tripal, you know, very much for your uh, contributions today. Um, if if anyone has any, you know. Further questions, you know, please feel free to reach out to, um, to uh, the, or the whoever you receive the registration email from. I think it's Sahima, so uh, she'll be able to direct your questions to anyone on the panel. Um, the the presentation is also available, uh, will be available to all of you. And as Ed mentioned earlier, there's a much more detailed uh, presentation behind it. Um, and if you'd like a sort of one-on-one. -on -one uh, discussion uh, with any of the team, you know, please feel free to reach out. Uh, and Ed, would you, anything else from Ed, Becky, Tripal that you'd like to sort of finish off with? Any comments? Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Nice to speak with everyone, uh, but nothing further from me. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, and, and we'd be absolutely delighted to have further conversations with people about their, their specific issues locally. Very much. Uh, up for that. Okay.
Great. Well, thank you all very much. And, um, you know, we'll hopefully have another one of these in the near future and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.